Hello everyone, my name is Evan Freiberger and today we're going to be talking about this low pressure system that is going to be sweeping across the United States and potentially causing some severe weather, but there is one thing that is kind of missing with our storm right now and it is pretty important for storms, especially in the southeast where we usually get a little bit more moisture in the air, making the air more dense and that can have some issues if you're missing some key ingredients. So if we hop over to where our low pressures and our high pressure systems are right now, you can see generally we have a little bit of ridging over here in the eastern United States, keeping things relatively nice for now, but eventually that is going to change. You can see that we do have a low pressure system right over here. And this low pressure system right over here, located pretty much right in this area, is going to eject into the United States and eventually up to the north, leaving our frontal boundary behind. But generally, models are in somewhat of agreement that we are going to get some moisture is going to come up from the Gulf of Mexico into this area as our trough ejects. And as I move that forward, you can see that happening exactly just like that here on the 500 millibar height change, which again shows our low pressure or our anomalously lower pressure moving off to the north and east kind of leaving our surface boundary behind. You can also see that we have another ejecting low pressure system that is coming out of Canada. This is gonna bring some cooler air behind it, and that will eventually bring that cooler air all the way down into the Eastern United States and the Southeast with a little bit of a cool down. It's definitely gonna be colder than normal, but in terms of the intensity of the cold, we're not really that close to a like Arctic blast or anything. We're just getting a little bit of cooler. Canadian air be slingshotted into the United States. And also on the northern side of this low pressure system, we're going to be watching out for some snow to kind of come up into this area, potentially could get up to six inches and above in some spots. But unfortunately, it's not going to really make it too far down to the south. Not a whole lot of people are really going to be able to see much snow at all. Just the folks that are kind of in the northern regions of the upper plains and going into the Great Lakes. Now, another important thing with our storm is our upper level winds. And essentially, these allow for storms to fire. You see these little wind barbs back over in here and here. You can see how these guys down here are facing more in this direction. And these guys over here are facing more in that direction. And that kind of creates a void in the middle. And that allows for air to rush in and up causing thunderstorms to allow to grow. These winds also influence the upper portion of the storm and allow for some rotation to happen as long as you have some lower level winds. And you can see that as our trough kind of moves over Kansas, we start to see those winds really pick up there. Still somewhat of an organized trough. It's still kind of technically a weaker lower pressure system here. And it looks like Monday into Tuesday, we are definitely going to have some elevated severe weather chances with the potential for some tornadoes as well back over here into Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and eventually moving into the southeast. But I will say the forcing is a lot weaker and our trough is a lot weaker as well as it moves into the southeast. So I would expect Monday for at least for now, unless the models change to be the most dangerous day out of all these for severe weather. Now, if we come over to the lower level winds and we move this to about Monday, 12 p.m., you can see that we are going to have around 20 to 40 knots of lower level shear. That's going to be plenty to support tornadoes. You can see how far north this wind shear is. So we'll kind of circle this little area. The blue will be our wind shear. This also helps with spin, but we are looking for more perpendicular winds. And you can see that we do have some, but they are more further up to the north as well. So those are technically be our most favorable winds. So there's our little pocket of shear right there. Our instability will be in the green. Here's our instability just barely reaching up into that pocket of higher lower level winds and instability makes air parcels rise a little bit better, makes them more buoyant. Once we get up into those 1000 joules per kilogram, which we do have where this green line is denoted, that is where you typically see the area where, you know, storms can sustain themselves and be more organized, potentially dropping bigger hail, more severe winds and a little bit have a higher, usually a higher chance of producing tornadoes. You can still technically get tornadoes with less instability, but when you're talking about like zero joules per kilogram, you're probably not going to see much more than rain as this moves into areas like southern Arkansas and Louisiana, if that instability can never make it up that north. But yeah, you can see generally here that we do have a slight overlap in some of our best kinematics. So there is definitely a little pocket here where we could definitely see some increased tornadic activity if our lower level trough brings some of these stronger shear values a little bit further to the south. We are definitely gonna have to watch for maybe a little bit more of a widespread severe 
severe weather potential. And you might still be able to eke out a couple of tornadoes on the northern portion of this if that instability is a little bit further north than what is forecasted. One way to check that out is to compare and contrast models. So we kind of zoom in here. Here's Texas right here. There's our instability, 1,000 joules per kilogram there. You can see the HRRR has a little bit more instability, but still generally in that same area. So no major disagreements there. We have another model, the HWRF, a little bit further south at this point. Not as much instability on the FV3, the HWRF NSL, and around in the same place. And yeah, I mean, you can see generally the trend is that our instability is going to be hanging out down here, kind of away from those larger shear values. Now let's compare and contrast where our wind shear is. And yeah, you can see a lot of these same models are bringing that shear further up to the north. You can see some of these have maybe some stronger wind shear further down to the south. So we do have to watch out for that scenario. If some of these models, which I would call them outliers right now, as most of the models have that stronger wind shear further up to the north. But if we have that further down to the south, could also see that tornado threat extend a little bit more south into kind of central southern Texas over there near where, like where Killeen and Austin, Texas are. But yeah, so generally, though, our strongest wind shear and our most favorable kinematics at least in terms of our winds are going to be further up into the northeastern portion of Texas. So where that instability goes is going to be very important. But some of our models are actually indicating that we might be missing a key feature here with our storm and our and, and that's essentially lapse rates. Here's a great way to think about lapse rates. You see down here with these little red dots on the bottom, that is warmer air. And as you go up into the atmosphere, it cools down into these green dots. But this isn't that big of a temperature gradient. We're you're typically looking for those reds transitioning into blues as we get into the mid levels of our atmosphere. So watch down here. This is a little uh, water molecule here. And if I launch that, it really doesn't do much. It's really hard for it to grow in a very low lapse rate environment. This would be around four to five lapse rates here. But as we start to grow just below six lapse rates, you can see that our parcels do start to launch here, start to go up into the atmosphere. And this again is around six lapse rates here. So that's essentially the minimum amount that you can have to see a parcel launch. If you go kind of just below that, you can see that it does kind of launch as you go in into you know five to six but it's a lot slower if we look at the difference between a moderate gradient and a low gradient you can see that it's definitely launching a lot faster and if we go all the way up into a streak gradient talking about seven eight nine lapse rates you can see that those temperatures cool down on the top and we still have those warm temperatures near the surface watch how fast that launches so that's why lapse rates are important your molecules in the atmosphere although more buoyant because of the instability really need that temperature gradient in order for that updraft to form. That's essentially what you're looking at here as these launch up into the sky. And on the GFS, we are seeing some lapse rates here in the six. But look at this. This is honestly a little bit bullish in comparison to some of our other models. In the red area here, these are our instability values that are above 500 joules per kilogram. And then this right here are our lapse rates in the gray going into the yellow of just above six and higher. So anything in the gray is six and higher, which again would allow our updrafts to be a little bit more robust. We'd have stronger storms. Now the HRRR has some things, but look, some of our models are struggling with these lapse rates and quite a few of them actually uh, are having, you know, anywhere from five to six and very sparse amounts of six degree lapse rates. And we've seen this many times in this area in particular, where we get these, what could potentially be a 10% hatch risk for strong tornadoes, especially with that shear environment. If we do have a little bit of an overlap in that lower level shear in our instability, which you've already determined there is but when you don't have those lapse rates. I mean, look at this. There's a lot of models here indicating that we might struggle with those lapse rates. So morning of we've got to watch tomorrow morning and going into our event. If our lapse rates are too low, we could see this event significantly underperform. So in terms of timing tomorrow and potentially even today, we could see some severe weather if we get some storms form. See, our models aren't very bullish, but there is a little bit of a risk for today. We'll be going over where that risk is in just a little bit. And then going into tomorrow afternoon, you can see that that instability starts to build in. But you see these storms out here, they're not looking super robust. Not a whole lot of red colors out there, indicating that those storms are struggling. And again, that is in that regimen where the lapse rates are a little bit lower. But right along this boundary, that is our cold front sweeping in. And a lot of these storms are behind that cold front, meaning that they might still have a little bit of a hail risk. But in terms of like a tornado risk, nothing too crazy at the beginning of our event. But as we move 
move into the afternoon you see that the instability does increase remember up here our instability is lacking but we still have the strongest shear so maybe some brief little spin up tornadoes but you can see out in front of our storm those lapse rates are struggling we do see some updrafts try to form out there but again a lot of them fail because of those lower level lapse rates are a little bit too low we could be talking about mainly a damaging wind event for tomorrow but we're still monitoring we still got about a day until this happens so we're still monitoring for some changes in our forecast you know if we start to see the models agree on higher lapse rates like the gfs is saying and then we wake up tomorrow morning and we're looking at the data with soundings and also maybe our instabilities a little bit further up to the north then we could be talking about maybe something a little bit more serious but for now it's one of those events that are kind of hanging on a knife's edge where we could see something a couple tornadoes happen or maybe just some rain and some damaging winds and after this event takes place we're going to be seeing this trough eventually eject into the southeast overnight here and you can see that front makes it through at around 3 a.m and then moves out and we could still have some storms behind that but a lot of this moisture it's going to be our main event could see some storms behind that we can go over to the nam model but we're probably going to use the rufus here because the nam i think is a little bit too slow with this storm the rufus kind of seems to over exaggerate the storms but i do think its timing is a little bit more accurate but yeah as our storms come through here in the early morning period you can see we have all that rain come through and then you can see a little boundary is still back here now the main question for tomorrow is is our atmosphere going to recover after that first initial round of storms we come over to our instability you can see that 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 actually does recover quite a bit you see here by our green line that's about where our kinematics are going to be the most favorable out here and you can see also that our wind shear is also a little bit more prevalent going into this day but one of the things that i want to note is that our winds near the surface or at least in our 850 millibars they are going in basically this direction but our upper and level winds are moving kind of in this direction so not super perpendicular a little bit directional there but i would say that that's not very conducive for a lot of tornadoes now we still could have a tornado risk maybe a couple tornadoes could be possible but overall that directional component is going to be an issue there and if we look at our lapse rates as well we are running into that same problem going into the day after tomorrow you can see that we have most of our models saying lower lapse rates too low lapse rates and one saying maybe it will be good enough so that's another thing to watch out for tomorrow but yeah today we are watching out for a severe risk as our trop initially ejects into parts of texas Talking about a low chance for tornadoes, main thing that's having this be a slight risk is our hail risk here. We could have quarter-sized hail over there near Midland and Odessa. Going into day two, however, we do have a slight risk out here. Again, pretty conditional, but definitely something to be at least aware of as we go into tomorrow. And again, that's going to be getting started in the afternoon, going into the nighttime hours. And main area where tornadoes are going to be possible is over there into northeastern Texas, over there near like Shreveport, very extreme southwestern arkansas with the two percent extending all the way into the mississippi border there and then going into day three we do have a marginal risk this could get upgraded to a slight risk really just depends on how our models change as we get closer if we see those lapse rates go up if we see those winds near the 850 millibar range get a little bit more perpendicular we could see a little bit more of an upgrade up to our tornado risk as we get closer but given the fact that we're still three days out things are still a little bit iffy now in terms of snow potential we are going to be seeing a little bit of a low pressure system develop as it moves up to the north and we could see some snow all the way from north dakota into montana and wisconsin and on the back side of that could see some of that lake effect snow also happen as the wind starts to stream over that area and you can see here denoted by this blue line that we are also going to see some temperatures start to get lower and lower as our low pressure system which is basically spinning like this brings some air from canada down into the northern united north kind of eastern united states more of like the midwest back over here and eventually the northeast could get into some cooler temperatures as well probably the most snow that we're going to see from this guy is going to be that lake effect snow which could last for a couple 
couple of days. And then as we go into around the five to six day time frame, another low pressure system might bring snow a little bit further to the south. But again, snow forecasts really don't get accurate until about three days out. So we got a couple more days to wait until we can really pin down what this will do. If we compare this to some of our other models, you can see there is a vast difference across the board. And we're not going to see that become more consistent until later. So watch out for that clickbait out there. Uh, people using only the GFS to be like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have a big snowstorm. It could be true, but it, you know, we just don't know. So there's no point in saying something will happen if you have no certainty if it actually will. So in terms of snowfall up here into Montana, North Dakota, going into Minnesota, we could be talking about a strip of three to four inches of snow, potentially getting up to six or seven inches up there in the UP of Michigan. And as our storm continues to move off to the east and we start to see some of that lake effect snow, we could end up with three to maybe seven inches of snow. We could get higher amounts than this, just depending on just how much moisture there is to squeeze out of this. You know, there are some pretty warm temperatures still in the Great Lakes, which will allow for some smaller updrafts to form and also that lake effect snow to be a little bit more robust. So we could see this creep up over a foot in some isolated areas. And in terms of our temperatures here, it's going to be warmer over the next few days, especially down here in the southeast going up into the Great Lakes. And you could start to see that cooler air start to droop down into the United States. And we could actually get down to like the 30s, maybe the 40s in some spots, potentially into the single digits up here into parts of North Dakota, going into parts of Minnesota, as well as we go into the 27th. It's going to be early morning on Thanksgiving. But not too bad. It'll be chilly, but it's not going to be really that annoying, especially for the folks up here in the Northeast. You guys are used to this. Probably the people that will suffer the most, if you can say that, is going to be down here in like Tennessee, uh, Northern Georgia, uh, where we're just really don't like anything any temperatures below 50 degrees uh but yeah after that moves through you know that heat's gonna build back into some of these areas not gonna be as warm as it was this week but we could still be hanging out in the 50s and 60s for a lot of the southeast and uh, maybe uh a little bit bigger of a storm could come through but again uh we're really not in the range of confidence sometimes with temperatures uh you can get uh you know some sort of agreement with our models uh far out but again that changes a lot i mean how many people have been hyping up this thanksgiving giving cold for big snow and big cold and you know we're really talking about a pretty minimal push of cold air here that's gonna be it for me folks if you did enjoy this video please hit that like and subscribe button we don't really hype over here so we'll just keep you in the know without tugging on your emotions and making you freak out about every little storm but yeah take it easy hope to see you guys on the next one peace